please join me in welcoming back Bill Gates. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. I am excited to be here as part of this dedication uh, for the new Gates Center. It's an honor and it's a privilege uh, to have been involved. Uh, there's a great number of people who've made this possible, uh, starting with Carnegie Mellon President Jerry Cohen and CMU's Board of Trustees. Uh, their vision and their support, as well as the uh, thoughts of Professor Guy Blaylock, who traveled across the country to gather ideas from successful academic buildings to ensure that both the Gates and Hellman Centers would meet the demanding goals laid out. Uh, clearly, uh, they did a great job, and, and uh, we see it uh, before us today. I'd, I'd like to particularly thank uh, Henry and Elise Hillman for being essentially partners together in uh, getting this area to uh, be so fantastic. A number of other people uh, are, have been key to this, uh, including more than 20 uh, Microsoft employees, and it's really no accident that that came together. Uh, the link between Microsoft and Carnegie Mellon has always been very strong, and the list of distinguished alumni and professors who've been a key part of Microsoft's success is also long, uh, including Rick Rashid, Anup Gupta, Arnold Blim, and Harry Shum. Many of these people provided significant donations uh, to help with the building, and I know they're thrilled to give back to CMU for the important role it, it played in their careers. If anything, the connection between Microsoft and CMU is stronger than ever. Uh, they're working together on a, a wide range of projects spanning some of the most ambitious and exciting things in all of computer science. There's also a strong foundation, a connection between the Gates Foundation and CMU. Uh, one of those is that uh, there's over a dozen uh, Gates Millennium Scholars here, and I had a chance to meet with them and talk about their great work uh, earlier today. Another example is a, a project on learning. Uh, this is the Carnegie Mellon Open Learning Initiative. And I think this is a, a, an amazing and uh, critical piece of work. The idea is to use online interactive material to adapt to the student, to see what the student's confused with, so the student immediately knows what they're understanding and what they're not. So the teacher can see how they're doing explaining the complex concepts and dynamically adapt the in-classroom time to make sure uh, that the right things are covered. Also, the course itself, by being online and measured, can be in a, a state of constant improvement. The idea of these virtual labs and intelligent tutoring systems, I think, can really revolutionize education. And we need to revolutionize education. You know, today more than ever, if we look at uh, the quality of education that most students in this country receive, it's very, very poor. The experience that you've had uh, before you came to CMU and, of course, uh, here at CMU itself, is unfortunately the exception rather than the rule. And as we think about technology and all the things that's revolutionized, you know, buying airplane tickets and looking at DNA data, I think it's perhaps most amazing how little so far it's changed the practice of education itself. And yet, in terms of empowering people to achieve their potential, not just in the United States, but in the world as a whole, uh, having great teachers, having a great education uh, is one of the most critical things we need going forward. And so I believe that by taking the work being done here, uh, bringing it together with videos of the great professors, uh, bringing it together with lots of data that analyze what's going on in different school systems, making it freely available out on the internet for constant improvement, I believe that 
education can be radically improved. And so any student who wants to learn something, either in a classroom type environment or in a purely online environment, uh, that, that should be possible. And so it's great to see the ambition uh, taking place in this particular project that the, uh, the foundation is helping to fund. Uh, right now, there are 40 community colleges that are partnered with that project, actually putting these courses to work and making their contributions to making them better. Pioneering work in, in computer science, of course, has been going on here for over a half century, and it was great to see uh, some of the highlights of the, the big, bold contributions that have been made. I think this is going to not only continue, but accelerate. The potential for using computing, particularly in some of these cross-disciplinary areas like computational biology, uh, the promise is uh, greater than ever. Uh, robotics is a, a fantastic example of this, whether it's learning or vision, uh, speech recognition, uh, mechanical modeling, all of these things really get pushed to the state of the art, and CMU has been a, a huge leader in this. And it was fun to meet uh, one of CMU's uh, latest robots. Uh, I was told that next time I come, it'll give me a tour around the building, uh, and it was very polite to me, and uh, they said it would go get coffee for me, but we didn't uh, actually try that out. Uh, so there's real progress being made, you know, more and more ambition. In fact, if we think of a lot of uh, societal problems in terms of health care, uh, you know, an elderly population. Many of these, if we think a decade and two decades out, uh, the role of, of robots in helping to deal with those problems and in continue to improve the quality of life, I think can be uh, very strong. Uh, there's some amazing people who do this robotics work, uh, including Red Whitaker, Manuela Veloso, Matt Ma Mason, and, and many others. And uh, we really appreciate the connection uh, that exists between Microsoft, who's also working on robotics and very optimistic about these things, and the way that we're working together on the uh, Center for Innovative Robotics. And I think with the right leadership, we can bring everybody in the world together to learn, uh, to try amb ambitious new things. And I think people will be very surprised at the pace of progress in robotics. Uh, you know, even very tough problems like being able to help uh, move a patient in medicine, you know, in 10 or 20 years, I, I think it's very possible uh, that we'll have those things. Language technologies will be another area where you'd pick where uh, Carnegie Mellon has been very much out in front, even going back to the original hidden Markov work uh, that uh, was in 1974. Uh, uh, the, the school has stayed at the forefront of that uh, with a lot of speech activity. In fact, I think if you took any group at Microsoft and said what had the highest percentage CMU graduates, it might be our, our speech recognition group. Uh, and of course, the work here continues to push the forefront. Uh, turns out many of these problems are much more challenging uh, than we thought, and that makes them more interesting, more, more fascinating. And there really is uh, pretty incredible progress. I saw today a very clever technique uh, that's been used to help machine translation and engage humans in uh, assisting to show how articles should be translating, and then that base of data is there uh, to help with the, the machine approach that over time, I think, uh, can be very, very good. And we can look into the future and expect that our cell phone uh, will be able to talk to it, you know, ask it questions, tell it to schedule something. You know, that's going to be common sense, and that, I'd say, is uh, on an even near-term horizon, perhaps in five years. Certainly Microsoft, Google, many others are uh, putting that uh, out for various narrow applications today. Uh, and there's every reason to expect that'll uh, get even broader. So we're in the midst of an incredible transformation where computer science, including the work here, is, is sitting in a central role. And if you think about, well, what's biology about? Well, a lot of it's about analyzing DNA and protein expression and finding patterns that only a rich software approach uh, will make possible. Now, when we think about learning, uh, computer science is at, at the center of that. When we think about modeling new materials, uh, when we think about you know, making new vaccines, all of those things, uh, software element uh, is, is stronger than before. You know, eventually, with this genomic data, we will be able to solve uh, very tough medical problems. Uh, one of the diseases I uh, spend a lot of time uh, 
learning about and hoping that we can make progress on is malaria. Uh, today, over a million people a year die of malaria. Uh, that's mostly children in Africa. Malaria at one time was spread uh, almost, over almost the entire globe. In fact, even in uh, northern United States, there was malaria, and there was a lot of malaria down in the south. Well, in fact, fortunately, uh, it didn't have a strong hold uh, as you got that far north, and so the invention of DDT as an insecticide and the application of that actually eliminated it, and we only think about malaria today when we travel into those regions. Unfortunately, what that's meant is that the focus of uh, investing on that particular disease is, has been very low. Uh, but there's reasons to be optimistic uh, that advances in modeling drugs, modeling vaccines uh, will, will help us get there. Also, we're modeling the disease itself. Uh, techniques that come out of physics of uh, modeling uh, actually let us look at various factors, like the types of vector and the weather, and understand what new tools we'll need, uh, bed nets, medicines, uh, indoor spraying, that will let us reduce the malaria map uh, very dramatically. And so you wouldn't normally make a, a connection between malaria and those million lives a year and the need for advances in software. But in fact, that connection uh, is very strong uh, and you can expect to see uh, great progress because of the kind of technology uh, that's worked on here. Also, when we look at a, a tough problem like energy, and I spent yesterday in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the Department of Energy uh, you know, trying to understand the sort of complex politics of various things like a cap and trade bill. But in fact, if you zoom out and think, you know, how can we have it all? How can we have uh, developing nations uh, experience the kind of lifestyles that we're used to, uh, have our lifestyles advance? The fact is it's innovation, innovation in material science, uh, for solar thermal, for solar, solar photovoltaic, modeling approaches for new nuclear designs that would be radically different and avoid some of those problems. And again, we come back to computer science and some of the very advanced work going on. It is very possible, and I'm optimistic to say it's likely, that over the next two decades we'll get energy approaches that not just meet an environmental constraint of not uh, putting out uh, greenhouse gases, but also that meets the constraint of being less expensive. Because the only way to help the poorest is to bring the cost of energy down from what it is today. Uh, that's transport, that's fertilizer, that's clean water. It's the empowerment uh, for them to live the lifestyles that we uh, take for granted. And so there, uh, the central role of software is uh, uh, providing something that's important. So we're going to see some great things in the, uh, the years ahead. Uh, some of these advances are being developed here at Carnegie Mellon right now. Uh, others uh, will come along as we get new generations of students here in this facility taking advantage of, of what we're uh, dedicating today. So I'm always inspired when I come here. I'm ex inspired by the great minds that are here and the ones that will be coming here. And I'm inspired by the opportunities to do work that's both fun and interesting, but also makes a big difference, not just in the United States, uh, but to the world as, whole, as a whole. Uh, so I'll be following your work, and I can't uh, wait to see uh, these great advances uh, that are delivered and the, the progress that will enable. Thank you. Now. So I'm pleased that Bill Gates is able to answer some questions. I ask that people who want to ask questions, and I encourage you to do so, to come up and use these two microphones, and we'll have a, a session here. Right here. Uh, my name is Leanne Sudal, and I'm a PhD student studying computer science education and how people learn about computers. With the amount of great work that your foundation does in terms of bringing education to uh, urban schools and the less privileged children, how do you see computing literacy for our next generation as they try and reach towards Carnegie Mellon? 
Well, certainly in rich countries like the United States, the opportunity to use computers and be familiar and comfortable with them and to actually have them be a key part of the educational process has really become like reading literacy itself. It's something that we've got to make sure uh, is available to everyone. Our best ally in doing that is that the price of computers continue to come down and the price of connectivity continues to come down. If you buy, you know, say a netbook type computer for a couple hundred dollars, if you're lucky enough to be in a place with Wi-Fi access, uh, you know, use that computer over a number of years. Uh, particularly if it can avoid your having to buy textbooks, you're already at the point where it's a net savings for the students, where those four or five textbooks, you know, we've got to do a little more work to get that done, uh, but you're net ahead. One of my favorite projects that the foundation did uh, was working with the over 50,000 libraries in the United States and helping to provide computer hardware, but not just the hardware, the right software and the training. And when we embarked on that, uh, we did a pilot project down in Alabama. We wondered if the librarians would embrace it. You know, this is a strange machine, and you know, is it just kids coming in to do something weird? Uh, and you know, how do you deal with the thing? It breaks, and people stand in line. But in fact, by really learning and working with them, uh, we were able to uh, get an incredible reception. In fact, it's really revitalized the libraries in rural areas even more so than in urban areas, but in, in both, I'd say. And so that's, that's been very successful, and it's been maintained over time. So if a kid doesn't have his own machine, you know, it's community centers, libraries, schools, there ought to be ways that you can get access. And that's an important threshold, because it's only when we make that assumption that these interactive learning tools, like the uh, Carnegie Mellon Online uh, Initiative, it's only then that you can require those and actually you know, maybe even reduce the time in class and have, have the interactive learning be part of that. So getting pervasive access uh, is, is an enabling factor. My name is uh, Thomas Wright. I'm a uh, freshman in the School of Computer Science. Uh, and this sort of ties in with her earlier question. How do you feel about uh, the open software or the open source software project, and what are some of your personal experiences in that? Well, clearly there's been free software. You know, all, there's always been free software. There always will be free software. And the, the great thing about all marketplaces is you get this dynamic. Uh, where you know, somebody wants to go off and start a company and pay salaries for people, that's a good thing. They pay taxes, create jobs. Uh, and so that software, they have to make it better than what it's ever free and be able to charge for that. You know, hopefully the people who use whatever great work they do every once in a while will pay them so they can uh, pay their salaries. And then at the same time, you have things that are done for free. You know, the original Unix system done out of Bell Labs was a a free piece of software, and everybody you know, looked at that, benefited from that. Uh, there's various descendants of that that are used. The original browser, uh, University of Illinois piece of work, was a free piece of software. Now, that never got much usage because it was a small-scale team that did it. It was actually more larger projects that came along later that actually moved that thing forward. So you have a very positive dynamic. It's a market-type system uh, where, depending on the category of software, You'll either have the really expensive stuff, the mid-expensive stuff, the cheap stuff, or the free stuff will have different uh, shares. You know, if you go to a corporation and look at the database they use, they typically use a fairly expensive piece of software for that. If you go and look at consumers, you know, then you get more down to the lower end. So it's a very healthy dynamic. I do think that in time, you, there won't, it won't tilt in the sense I do think that there will be jobs working as a software person, uh, which will be supported by uh, the commercial element that is part of this dynamic mix. Hello. Hello. I'm Paul, a uh, sophomore chemistry major and Gates Millennium Scholar, which actually leads me to my question. Uh, how do you go about, you and Melinda, of course, and also um, Mr. Hellman, go about deciding, like, where and how much time to dedicate to the philanthropies that you do, because there's a lot of causes out there, but at the same time, you can't do everything all the time. Now, that's an excellent question. 
And it's a troubling question, because when you first get into philanthropy and people know that you might write some checks, uh, there's no shortage of stories from you know, individuals who are kind of down on their luck, who just, you know, a small loan would uh, be unbelievable, uh, out to very, very tough problems. And you know, in, certain, in terms of magnitude, that's pretty simple. You take whatever you think is appropriate for your, your kids to have, which uh, certainly in my case is a percentage, is very small. Uh, they haven't voted on that, but they won't get to vote on it. Uh, <laughs> uh, they may feel a little, it's a little too small, but oh well. Uh, and then the rest of it, you want to give back to society uh, to have the, the greatest possible impact. And if you look at the world at large and say, okay, what, what, cause, what global cause should you pick? You know, I can give you how I ended up picking uh, global health and empowering the poor as the primary thing our foundation goes after. If you go back to the 1960s, uh, the world was characterized by very few rich countries that represented less than a third of the world, and then the rest were very poor countries. And there were almost none in the middle. China was very poor. India was very poor. Uh, you know, everybody but parts of Europe, uh, starting Japan, Western Europe, uh, Japan, the US, Canada, Australia. And then if you move forward to the year, say, 2000, uh, it was very different, where you had about two thirds of the world was doing pretty well. It was clearly on a positive cycle without special help that the virtue of the more educated you get, the more stable your society is, the more you're, you're doing uh, good products. You know, countries like Brazil and Mexico that back in 1960 were undistinguished from, say, Sub-Saharan Africa, actually poorer in both cases than most of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you know, they had moved up in a dramatic way. China is the most dramatic of all. Uh, because of the reforms that actually didn't start until 1979, but it's the greatest creation of wealth the world has ever seen, and reduction, and it's not just economic, it's, uh, you know, in the 1960s, uh, over 20 million children died every year. Uh, children under five died. Uh, most recently, uh, last year, that number's down to 8.8 .8 million. And so how do we go, when the births have gone up a lot, because the population's higher, it's gone up a lot, how do we more than reduce those deaths by a factor two? It's only two things. One is, as you get wealthier, your food, your lifestyle, your shelter is just better, uh, and so you're less subject to disease. And the second is the miracle of, of vaccines that have come in for something like measles and, and cured all those lives. So seeing, you know, my view in philanthropy is if you don't know any example where something's worked, uh, then, wow, you were in uncharted territory. You knew a few of those, uh, but it's better to pick a paradigm that's, that's been successful and see how you can catalyze more of that. And in the case of uh, these poor countries, what happened that, that graduated and became part of the rich countries is a mixture of good health, uh, uh, literacy, and reduction in population growth. And the strongest connection is as you improve health, it reduces population growth, which, and it, it increased literacy. Now, when I first saw that, that was a paradox, because you think, well, if you make people healthier, then you get more people, right? Because you're avoiding death. So the answer is, very quickly, in less than half a generation, uh, parents adjust, that is the fertility, they drop the fertility rate to more than compensate, way more than compensate for the uh, improvement in health. And it's actually well understood now that what's going on is that in a household, you're having enough kids that even given the uncertainty of health, that you're gonna have two to three survive to be an adult. And so the more health problems you have, the more you have to get this large number just to have the insurance of having the high probability of having somebody to take care of you because you don't have social security or anything. And that is why health is so catalytic. Anyway. Um, uh, and so I, you know, I decided, okay, we'll go do health because you can save lives in global health. You can spend less than a thousand dollars, and you can save a life. Uh, you know, airbags, for example, very good thing. Uh, in that case, you spend ten million dollars, you save a life. Uh, you know, so it's good. We should do that. But the lives saved in that technique are, 
you, you know, it's costing you 10,000 times as much. That is, if you didn't spend that money to save that one life, you could save 10,000 lives because these vaccines aren't being produced and provided. But, you know, that hopefully will, will get fixed. So that, you know, I, in my case, I pick health uh, and helping the poor as the global problem. And then I decided to pick one problem, uh, and this was with my wife, Melinda, uh, totally. Uh, one problem that was in the United States, which had created the environment that allowed the, the wealth to be created, and that was education. And that's where the online learning and measuring teachers and scholarships, uh, those things come out of saying, okay, what, what one thing, if you could help it even a little bit, would make the future of this country better than any other problem you could work on in, in education. With it, we've had a particular emphasis, particular emphasis on high school education is, is what we've chosen. So that's a long answer to uh, how you decide to spend $30 billion. <laughs> in case any of us need to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you have that problem. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, Warren Buffett had the same problem, but yeah, he, he made, made me, me do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Joe. I'm from uh, China. Uh, so um, I want to ask, how do you um, feel about the huge copyright issue in China, like illegal copies of software? Well, I'm in Tepper School of Business, so. Well, the, the issue of you know, how intellectual property should be priced. That's gonna, it's a big issue. It's gonna be around uh, for a long time. You know, I'm sure people get my vaccines. Uh, they don't notice, say, ooh, thank God somebody paid for software. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> when I started Microsoft, uh, the first, big uh, sort of thing I got known for amongst all these, uh, it was, nobody was in this business, but there were these computer clubs, and I'd go around and visit the computer clubs, and I'd left the paper tape around, and so somebody took it and copied it. Uh, so my first letter was called an open letter to hobbyists that said, hey, come on, you guys, quit ripping off my paper tapes. Uh, if you don't pay for this stuff, we can't write anymore. And that was my first and last, you know, kind of outraged emotional statement about copyright violation. <laughs> Based on the response to that, I decided, oh, you, you never, uh, being upset about it is never effective. And, you know, for some products, you just have to figure out what the price is uh, that it's going to be attractive to the market. Sometimes you can do that, sometimes you can't. China, if you compared, if you said, at a certain level of wealth, people stop copying software, and, said, oh, and compared that about across various countries. The richer a country is, the less copying there is. It doesn't drop to zero. You know, maybe there's some people here who have music they didn't pay for, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it drops, particularly in business use, it drops. And in individual use, it never drops to zero. But what's unique to China is you have large businesses using software without paying for it. Super profitable large businesses. You know, take two of the five most profitable businesses in China. They don't pay for their software. So that's pretty, that's a case where the Chinese have done something quite unique. Uh, but <laughs> I, I'm not complaining about it. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of China uh, and a lot of great things <laughs> going on there. Uh, but, you know, we've all got things to work on. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Sure. Hi, my name is Kevin. I'm a sophomore in the School of Computer Science. I first want to thank you and the Hillman Foundation for giving us a new home. Um, so this question is from online. A lot of people wanted to ask about your philanthropy. So what is your opinion on modern philanthropy, uh, philanthropy today? Do you think it's harder to get people to donate, or, especially in the light of the uh, current economic state, or do you think it's actually a lot easier? Well, I definitely think that it's tougher uh, since the financial crisis to get people to donate. Now, th it's fantastic that the drop-off has been less than I would have expected. If you'd given me this scenario of how much, how tough things have been, I would have predicted more drop-off. 
But it's a very tough situation for a lot of foundations because they have two sources of income. One is the current donations, and those have dropped off. Uh, and the other is that they often will have their endowment uh, in varying degrees in the stock market. And so of the top 20 foundations in the US, the average loss in the uh, corpus uh, was about 28% uh, over a one-year period. We lost 20%, so we're really smart. Uh, uh, and now a lot of them have gained some of that back, but, but nowhere near all of it. So you have both your, your corpus that you expected to increase. You, people were kind of spoiled by a lot of years there with that. Well, you know, is it up 5% this year or 15%? And you particularly had a thing where there was this jealousy effect, which happens in many systems, where people looked at the returns that Yale and Harvard had as they were using exotic things. Well, those guys actually got incredibly above normal returns for the exotic things they did because they saw them before other people. Then as other people rushed in, take Timberland, Timberland got ridiculously mispriced, but it was a faddish thing where that had worked for Harvard at one price and it was gonna be a disaster for the other. So you had both this lemming effect uh, and the market as a whole uh, being a problem. And so you had a lot of uh, foundations, including uh, some at educational institutions, where they really what was hurt. Uh, I didn't study the CMU figures uh, and had to cut back. So these are these are tough times for foundations, and they're trying. You know, they're not used to having to cut back, and some are actually being pretty smart about it uh, and everything. Now, as, as the U.S. economy is going to come back, it could take a while. You know, people like to talk about the shape of the recovery, but this country will keep creating wealth. Why will it keep creating wealth? Because of the things we've been talking about, the, the new medicines and robots, and you know, which country is by far going to be doing these innovations for the future? Our share of innovation may not be you know, what it was in 1948, say, at the end of World War II, but it's still extremely high. China's increasing its share, which is a great thing for the world. The more innovation there is, you know, when you get a life-saving drug, you don't say too many times, say, where was that made again? Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're going to get back on a good track. And so I think philanthropy will get back on a good track. And one of the things I like to do is, is share with other people how much fun I'm having uh, giving the money away, you know, trying to make sure it's not, not misspent. And, uh, you know, with the, the subtext of, boy, I'd love to have, have more join in. Thank you very much.